Hello and welcome again. It's Sunday, the 9th of May, here in India, and no IB students in this country will be sitting for the exam which is scheduled for this Friday. But this video, of course, is intended for all of my good friends in places like Singapore and Hong Kong and Taiwan, and of course, the People's Republic of China, especially those of you at the wonderful Shanghai American School. Pushy Campus. A big shout out to my former school. And now let's move in, as I promised, and take a look at some of the tips for this year's examination based on the feedback of the examiners in November 2020. In this video, I am going to focus on five specific points highlighted by the examiners from November to look at for the future. And these are listed here for you to see, and I'm going to take you into the paper now. And let's have a look specifically at what the examiners meant when they highlighted these five points. And here you can see this first question, dealing with the early part of the syllabus, atomic structure. And here you can see that the chlorine atom has the electronic structure 287. That is, that is its simple electronic structure, but the chloride ion has a structure of 288. Both of them carry 17 protons, however, and they're both shielded by the same two inner electrons followed by eight outer electrons. So it follows that the species with the eight electrons on the outside has got the same effective nuclear charge as the one with seven electrons on the outside. So therefore, the one with eight, which is Cl minus, would have a slightly larger atomic radius. And this, of course, is the case. If you check the literature, you would see that the chloride ion has a slightly higher atomic radius than the chlorine atom. Now, comparing the chlorine atom to the sulfur atom is the next question. And here, you could look at Z effective, the effective nuclear charge, with 16 protons in the nucleus of sulfur, compared to 17 in the nucleus of chlorine. But they both have these 10 shielding electrons, leaving a Z effective of 7 for the chlorine atom and a Z effective of 6 for the sulfur atom. And that, of course, results in chlorine having a slightly smaller atomic radius than sulfur. Next question was the one dealing with the relative abundance, the spectrometry data, the mass spectrometry data here shared in this question. And students had some difficulty not necessarily identifying that chlorine was 35 and you had an isotope of chlorine that was 37. Those are two generally well-known bits of information, isotopes being the existence of an element in more than one form, each form having the same atomic number or the number of protons, but different mass number or number of neutrons. So that's the case with the 35 peak and the 37, a, a smaller amount, of course, for the 37 here in blue, showing that chlorine 37 is less in abundance than chlorine 35. But the peak at 72, the peak at 74, and the peak at 70 might have confused students because Cl2, of course, 35 plus 35, that's 70. 72, a 35, and a 37 can join together. One radioactive or one chlorine 37, a heavier chlorine with a lighter chlorine, chlorine 35, giving you a Cl2 atom of 72. And then, of course, two 37s can combine to give you a total of 74. Then in this question dealing with oxidation number, always a difficult and challenging one for all students, more so for SL students. Here you have to determine, first of all, the oxidation state of manganese on the reactant side in MnO2. And in MnO2, you can see that it's got an oxidation state of positive 4. And in MnCl2, it's got an oxidation state of positive Two. You can tell this, of course, by knowing that the entire entity must be neutral and O carries a charge of minus 2 
and there are two oxygens which will be minus four. So therefore, to make the entire structure neutral, manganese must be positive four. And for the plus two, of course, it's obvious you could see that Mn has a positive two charge and it's reacting with Cl minus it's to form MnCl2. So there's this fall in oxidation number as you go from MnO2 to MnCl2. A fall in oxidation number of a species always means that that particular species is reduced. And whatever entity undergoes reduction some other entity has to undergo oxidation, but the entity that undergoes reduction is always characterized as being the oxidizing agent. So MnO2, which undergoes a fall in oxidation state to become MnCl2, that particular manganese atom is undergoing reduction, but MnO2 is an oxidizing agent. So whatever thing undergoes reduction is an oxidizing agent. And whatever thing undergoes oxidation is a reducing agent. And reduction, a fall in oxidation state. And oxidation, an increase in oxidation state. Then we had this question dealing with the bonding in ethene and chloroethene. And here you can see that the bond strength in chloroethene is a little bit weaker than the bond strength in ethene. And that has to do with the fact that there's some polarity because the shared electrons in the covalent bond between carbon and chlorine is pulled towards the chlorine and you have some element of polarity there and that of course creates a weaker bond and you can see the bond strengths being given here. Anything that has a chlorine attached to it leads to electrons being pulled towards the chlorine. And when those electrons are being pulled towards the chlorine, it allows a species like OH- to come in and to carry out a nucleophilic substitution reaction. A nucleophile is any species here like OH with its lone pair and its negative charge coming in here to replace the chlorine. A nucleophile has a lone pair that it can use to move towards some positive center and push an atom away. The positive center here is effectively created by the carbon, which, is, which has got a partial positive charge because it's attached to the highly electronegative chlorine, which pulls electrons towards it. So then the nucleophile has the opportunity to seek a positive center. That is what nucleophile means in search of a positive center and a nucleophilic substitution happens when an entity like OH- with its lone pair comes in and pushes out the chlorine from its position. SL students might not know that much about a nucleophile but a nucleophile is also considered a Lewis base. Lewis bases have lone pairs to donate so ammonia for example is going to be a Lewis base. A Lewis acid accepts a lone pair and reacts with a Lewis base in that way. So Lewis acids and Lewis bases are part of the HL syllabus. And so, of course, is SN1 and SN2 reactions, which are also a part of the HL syllabus. And on the topic of HL chemistry, these were the specific points raised by the examiners to note in the November 2020 examinations. But that will be the subject of my next video.